space programs, and uh, he's highly sought after for his perspective on space issues. Dr. Logston is Professor Emeritus of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. He was the founder in 1987 and the longtime director of George Washington Space Policy Institute and has also been a faculty member here at International Space University since 1989. Many people would argue that Dr. Logston is the father of space policy. He holds a BS in Physics from Xavier University, PhD in Political Science from New York University. His name has been synonymous with space policy and space history. Dr. Logston is author of the 2010 book, John F. Kennedy and the Race to the Moon, and just released this year, After Apollo, Richard Nixon and the American Space Program. He's also authored The Decision to Go to the Moon, Project Apollo and the National Interest in 1970, and is general editor of the multi-volume series Exploring the Unknown, selected documents in the history of U.S. civil space program. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker for this evening, Dr. John Logs. Good evening. Thank you for all for coming. As John said, I've written over the past five years after retiring from full-time teaching, but I'm not retired, uh, two books tracing the uh, decisions that have shaped the U.S. space program uh, almost since in, its inception. Uh, those books form the basis of, of what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'll see contrasting the decisions made by John Kennedy in his brief three years as president and Richard Nixon in his equally brief presidency since he had to resign. Those two sets of decisions really define almost all the, of what the United States has done, at least with respect to human spaceflight. Spaceflight is really the central element of what the United States government does in space. Kennedy, within a few months of becoming president in January of 1961, in response to the Soviet success in launching the first uh, cosmonaut into orbit, Yuri Gagarin decided that the United States could not, by default, let the Soviet Union be the leader in space, that it was in the national interest for the United States to assume a leading position in space and chose a mission to the moon and return safely to Earth as a way of demonstrating U.S. leadership in space. Even as that reached fruition in July of 1969 with the Apollo 11 mission, Richard Nixon, himself only six months in the presidency, was faced with the decision, what do you do after you go to the moon? His decision was to stop going to the moon, in fact, stop going anywhere on the development of a uh, space shuttle as a low-cost reusable uh, space vehicle. I think these decisions really are the only two decisions that have shaped what the United States has done in space until at least the recent past. As Kennedy entered the White House in January of 1961, no one really could have predicted uh, that he would, within four months, uh, commit the United States to send people to the moon. He had expressed almost no, evidence, almost no interest in space issues as a senator. Of course, as a congressman, that wasn't an issue yet. But even after Sputnik, he didn't get very much involved in space issues. He created a transition team to advise him on space. That, that transition team said de-emphasize human spaceflight, put a focus on robotic science. Kennedy's vice president was a very aggressive Texas politician named Lyndon Johnson who had become involved in space and in fact helped create the, the legislation that created NASA in 1958. Uh, and Kennedy, with not much interest in space, said, you, Lyndon, you take care of the space issues. And it was obvious that, that the Soviet Union was planning on launching uh, human into orbit. It still, to the general public, came as a surprise when, on April the 12th, 1961, Yuri Gagarin, Yuri Gagarin uh, was launched into space. And he didn't really do a whole orbit. He landed a little short of where he took off fun, so it wasn't all the way around the Earth and he ejected and parachuted out of the spacecraft. He didn't ride the spacecraft back to ground, but the Soviet Union kept that a secret. Uh, the Pope called it a universal good. 
the domestic political reaction in the United States was, why are we again second in space? Kennedy thought about it for a couple of days, and at the end of the meeting said, there's nothing more important. If the janitor can tell me how to become the leader in space, I'll talk to the janitor. His top assistant, Ted Sorensen, went into the Oval Office with Kennedy after this meeting, and they came out and said, huh, we're going to the moon. The decision was formed pretty quickly in Kennedy's mind. He sent out the requirements, and something that happened between Gagarin and this memo was the aborting U.S. Bay of Pigs invasion, where U.S. trained uh, Cuban rebels tried to invade Cuba and overthrow the Castro regime. Basically, Kennedy got cold feet and didn't provide the support that was promised, just as the Soviet Union was claiming its success. So that clearly reinforced his intention to do something. Kennedy said, is there any other space program which promises dramatic results in which we could win? Uh, he asked Lyndon Johnson to uh, organize quickly a consultation on answers to those questions. Why the moon? There was a technical answer, which is that the Soviet Union had a rocket that they had used for Sputnik, had used for Gagarin, but it was not capable of launching people uh, to the surface of the moon and get them safely back to Earth. Their weight of the, their spacecraft would be too heavy for that rocket. So both the United States and the Soviet Union would have to develop new rockets. And the United States had the services of the German emigre rocket engineer Werner von Braun. Von Braun was brought to Washington and said, you know, we have a, a good chance of beating the uh, Soviets to, to the moon. Dr. von Braun was not a modest person. He also kind of said, and you've got me and the Soviets don't, so we will win. And he was right. Apollo was a rocket building race. And the Saturn V rocket was remarkably successful. The Russian equivalent failed four times. The political rationale was provided in language that really represents the Cold War mentality. Former colonies were becoming independent, choosing what form of government, a socialist or democratic capitalist, whether to look to the United States or look to the Soviet Union. There was this kind of zero-sum competition for global le leadership. And in that context, NASA Administrator Jim Webb, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, told Kennedy, it's men, not merely machines, they capture the imagination of the world, and that the prestige uh, gathered from achievements like sending people to the moon was part of the battle along the fluid front of the Cold War. Kennedy didn't hesitate. The dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. The emphasis on Apollo as a way of impressing mankind, it was really a propaganda undertaking intended to send a message, a message of U.S. power, of U.S. strength, of U.S. superiority. Several presidents, George H.W. Bush in 1989, George W. Bush in 2004, have said similar words back to the moon, this time to stay, on the Mars. So, uh, but the difference between them and Kennedy is he backed up his words with action. The budget 89% after the first year of the speech, another 100%, 101% the next year, another 40% increase. Massive investment in the construction of facilities needed for the program. And NASA almost doubled in its civil service complement and the uh, aerospace workforce quadrupled. This was a peaceful but warlike mobilization effort to achieve a goal. When another U.S. president made a commitment that requires massive investments to achieve, my answer is probably not. Nixon was not the first president to record meetings. In fact, it was Franklin Roosevelt in the 30s. But Kennedy also recorded a number of his meetings. And here is a discussion 
really an argument between Kennedy and the head of NASA, Jim Webb. Former President Dwight Eisenhower, so highly respected, called it nuts. The security-oriented wing of the Republican Party said the real threat to U.S. security is in low orbit over our country, not on the moon. Why don't we spend money on the military space program rather than sending people to the moon? Even people said, are we really serious about doing this? The liberal wing of the Democratic Party said, look at the money we're spending on this, and how, how many schools, how many teachers, uh, how many college scholarships, how many housing developments we could spend for that money, that the priorities were out of whack. Kennedy took those criticisms very seriously. The Congress was ready in, in the late summer of 63 to cut the budget. If they had done that, in fact, they did do it, and put the end of the decade goal in some question. Kennedy responded, he was concerned about the growing cost. He, he was not a spendthrift. In fact, uh, one of his science advisors called him a cheapskate. He was worried about whether there would be continuing public and political support for the program. And he was worried about getting reelected in 1964 and whether his support of the lunar landing program would be a political vulnerability. In reaction to this kind of thinking, he <clears throat> pursued two parallel but different lines of thinking. One was, well, maybe we should make Apollo more military, more linked to our national security, not just prestige. And the other is, no, maybe we should not compete, but maybe we should ask for the Soviet Union to cooperate with us. Here's a long quote where Kennedy is saying, uh, we're in the middle of this journey, people are criticizing it, but when, when we get to the moon, people say it was worth doing. It's an inaugural address. He said, why don't we go to that together and explore the stars? Ten days after announcing Project Apollo, he met Nikita Khrushchev for the one and only time they had a face-to-face -face meeting in Vienna. The two discussed cooperation in going to the moon. And it was Khrushchev that said no, because it would reveal basically the vulnerabilities in our Soviet technical base. And then, after the United States won uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, forced the Soviet Union to, to remove missiles from Cuba, uh, Kennedy began a, a, a trying a, a kind of reset in relationships, what he called a new strategy of peace. Uh, the first thing was a, uh, a treaty for limited test ban, uh, 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 banning in limited ways uh, nuclear tests. And the second initiative he came up with uh, and announced before the United Nations, on it. most people don't remember this. I think. Finally, in a field where the United States and the Soviet Union have a special capacity in the field of space, there is room for new cooperation for further joint efforts in the regulation and exploration of space. I include among these possibilities a joint expedition to the moon. What if Kennedy had lived and Khrushchev had said yes? Would that have undermined the political support for Apollo and we would never have done it? Or could a cooperative undertaking have actually been created? That the Soviet Union in 1961, 62, and 63 did not have a lunar landing program. They were thinking about it, they were arguing about it, but the decision, Soviet decision to go to the moon didn't happen until August of 64. So while Kennedy was alive, we were racing only ourselves. After looking very carefully at the record and, and what exists, I'm not sure what would have happened if Kennedy had lived. He ordered a, a very comprehensive review of all space activities. McNamara in the Department of Defense said there's really no military value. Your idea, Mr. Kennedy, of making it more military in character has no basis. Of all organizations, the Bureau of the Budget said, we can afford it, there's no reason to stop. This review may have been briefed to Kennedy, but it wasn't finished until November the 29th of 1963. By that time, John Kennedy had been dead. Kennedy, on November the 16th, 
went to inspect progress at the Kennedy, and it wasn't the Kennedy Space Center, but Cape Canaveral. There he was given a briefing on the plans for Apollo, and NASA's number three, a man named Bob Siemens, Robert Siemens, who had gone to Harvard with Kennedy, uh, said, and he, maybe this is the first time he realized the magnitude. He went out then to the launch pad where a Saturn one was ready for a launch, which would give the United States the lead in lifting power, and lifting power was very important to Kennedy, uh, being able to launch heavy satellites. Bob Brown was a very good-looking, charismatic German nobleman. There they are looking up at the rocket. And here's my book cover. The day before Dallas, he dedicated an aerospace medical facility in San Antonio and gave my favorite Kennedy space speech. These options were all on the table. Backing off, relaxing the deadline, continuing to push cooperation, which I think he would have done. We have a long way to go. Many weeks and months and years. The long, tedious work lies ahead. There will be setbacks and frustrations and disappointments. There will be, as there always are, pressures in this country to do less in this area as in so many others, and temptations to do something else that's perhaps easier. But this research here must go on. This space effort must go on. The conquest of space must and will go ahead. That much we know. That much we can say with confidence and conviction. Frank O'Connor, the Irish writer, tells in one of his books, I Was a Boy, he and his friends would make their way across the countryside. And when they came to an orchard wall, it seemed too high and too doubtful to try and too difficult to permit their voyage to continue. They took off their hats and tossed them over the wall. And then they had no choice but to follow them. This nation has tossed its cap over the wall of space. And we have no choice but to follow it. Does not sound like somebody that was ready to quit. The idea of humanity's future in space was not part of Kennedy's worldview. He was a very pragmatic political animal who saw space leadership as something that the United States, if it wanted to be the leading global power, had to achieve. Was that a good decision? Looking back now, almost 50 years later, was it a good judgment? Once Kennedy was killed, Apollo became a monument to a fallen young president, and there was no chance of it being canceled. And in fact, Lyndon Johnson, as president, made sure that Apollo had the money to go to success and completion, even after the Apollo 1 fire, and even in the face of the uh, conflict in Vietnam and Southeast Asia, the urban riots, the desire to start the great society. NASA got money for Apollo, but not for anything else. And so when Nixon showed up in January of 69, it was clear that he would have to make the decisions of what to do after Apollo. Lyndon Johnson had explicitly said, I'm not going to do that. Leave it to the next guy. And the next guy turned out to be Richard Milhouse Nixon. Kennedy did not know much about space when he came into the White House. Nixon knew a fair amount. He has, after all, had been Eisenhower's vice president. He was very much involved in the discussions of how to react to Sputnik. In fact, it was Nixon, among others, but Nixon, who said, create a separate civilian space agency rather than have the Department of Defense do space, because that will be better image to the world. He was one of the fathers of NASA. He was willing to spend more money on space than Eisenhower was, but he didn't control the budget. In 1968, he spoke to an audience in Washington and said the two things you can read there. You know, we must support a space program that's second to none, but that's the long term. In the short term, the next president has to cut the space budget. Those inconsistencies, I think, really ran through Nixon's decisions on space, the tension between those two attitudes. Unlike Kennedy, who saw space and space competition as a geopolitical issue, Nixon saw it as an issue of domestic politics, of technological innovation, of jobs, 
and symbolically an element of, of U.S. as a great nation. But he gave responsibility for space not to his foreign policy people, but to his domestic advisors. Peter Flanagan came out of Wall Street as a financier. He was involved in, in the big money contributions to the Nixon campaign. And Nixon said right at the start he was going to balance the budget. And that influenced the amount of money he was willing to give to space. The day-by-day -day person in the White House that handled space political and policy issues was a young guy named Tom Clay Thomas Whitehead, 30 years old, MIT, PhD. It may surprise some of you that 30-year-olds are proposing crucial decisions on, on issues of national policy that happens all the time. The young, energetic people uh, around the president are the, where the ideas come from, and then they go up to the various layers for uh, review and approval, and ultimately, to the president. But young people can have a lot of influence on national policy. Right as Apollo 11 was, was approaching, uh, he's saying NASA is going to use it to try to force the president to budget increases, and that's not a very good idea. The president, in fact, may want to cut the budget after Apollo. And, and I think this had a lot of influence on the Nixon space policy. By contrast, Nixon chose people, a man named Tom Paine as the head of NASA, and Tom was a true believer uh, in the space vision, the space dream. He was a naval submariner in World War II, and was fascinated by naval history and naval analogies. He saw NASA and the United States as equivalent to the Portuguese school of navigation that helped train the people that took Western culture, European culture, around the world. Knew what to do after Apollo. Payne said, we need a new banner, and that banner is sending people to Mars. Even after the rejection of most of these ideas, as Payne got ready to leave NASA, he uh, uh, talked to his staff, senior staff, and said, it's got to be swashbuckling, buccaneering, privateering, like Admiral Nelson and his band of brothers. That kind of thinking was not very congenial to the White House. The vehicle for decisions on what to do after Apollo was a high level inside the government task force called the Space Task Group, headed by the Vice President, Spiro Agnew, when I moved to Maryland in 1966, Agnew was a candidate for governor, and he was a liberal candidate, even as a Republican. He was also, like most Maryland politicians of the time, crooked. Uh, and ultimately, they had to leave the White House because he was accepting bribes and brown paper bags in the White House. He left before Nixon did. Payne was not an experienced Washington person. He actually thought the vice president had influence which any student of American politics knows is not usually the case. Here are the uh, recommendations. They were centered around a Mars mission leaving as early as 1981, humans to Mars. Maybe 83, maybe 86. And before that, a 12-person space station in the mid-70s, growing to a 90-person, 90, 90 man, no women considered at this point, uh, space base, and ultimately a 100-person space base, a lunar orbiting, and then a lunar surface base, really a kind of bravado plan of something even more ambitious than Apollo. And oh, by the way, if you're going to build a space station, you have to take crew and supplies up and down, so you needed an Earth-to-orbit transportation system, something to shuttle. This is where the shuttle came from. The report was presented to Nixon on September the 15th. Here, here he is, Tom Payne, the other members of the Space Task Group. Nice words were said, but then the, the recommendations were put into the budget process. The budget process itself was chaotic. It turned out that Nixon and his close associates did not know how to run a government, and so there were bad revenue estimates and the tax increase that they didn't understand its impact. And each time they tried to uh, agree on a final budget level overall, the NASA budget was reduced. Most of you know that beginning in February of 1971, a uh, tape recording system was installed in the Oval Office. Plus, the 
So in listening to Nixon then, you'd say, well, he would have been supportive of a fairly aggressive, fairly ambitious space program. But here he is, uh, what, two weeks later? The United States should not drop out of any competition and a very true knowledge of exploring the unknown. That's one of the reasons I support the space program. They want to nail on space time. So I'm used to that. So what did Nixon think about space? Hard to tell. Tom Whitehead wrote a paper that Nixon embraced, which I call the Nixon Space Doctrine, which set out the core of Nixon space policy. As space expenditures must take their proper place. What we do in space must become a normal and regular part, not special like Apollo. I argue that this statement is the US space policy for the past 45 years. And so I think Nixon's decisions have had a much more lasting impact than John Kennedy's. The impact of this was, first of all, no continuing exploration beyond low Earth orbit, uh, and therefore no need for a big rocket. And in fact, NASA traded off building more Saturn V rockets in order to get money for the systems space station and space shuttle that it wanted to develop during the 1970s. The country spent billions of dollars developing the capability to go places in the solar system and in this period of a couple of weeks gave it up. We're now in 2015 trying to recreate the capability that we had in 1970. The budget constraints and given NASA's leadership's fear of the risks of continuing to go to the moon with the Apollo Saturn system, which is a very risky system, and the Apollo 13 near tragedy just underlined the risk. The NASA leadership, I think, what took the initiative to say, you know, we did what Kennedy asked us to do, we got people to the moon and back safely, let's quit while we're ahead. In 1970, NASA's leadership decided and recommended to the White House cancellation of two of the remaining six uh, Apollo missions. That happened. Uh, there would be no more missions after what turned out to be Apollo 17 after they were renumbered. So it wasn't Nixon that ended Apollo. It was a combination of Nixon's overall budget guidance and NASA's fear of the risks of continuing to operate the system. Nixon really turned sour on the moon very early. <laughs> the symbolic evidence for that are these two pictures. There's a picture of him meeting with science advisor Lee DeBridge here and Peter Flanagan in the Oval Office. And up here is the Apollo 8 Earthrise picture. It's less than two years. That picture was gone and replaced by a generic landscape. He pushed very hard in 70, and particularly in 71, for canceling two of the remaining four, Apollo 16 and 17. And as Apollo 17 left the moon in December 1972, uh, the White House issued a statement in the president's name saying this may be the last time in this century that men will walk on the moon. Well, Nixon, by his decisions, made sure that came true. He did have one idea with long-term, I think, positive consequences. He called it his pet idea, which was to fly non-U.S. people on U.S. spacecraft. It's kind of ironic. In 2015, we're flying U.S. people on non-U.S. spacecraft. Uh, but he, he pushed rather hard for the idea of finding programs where, as, as you see in this middle bullet, uh, he asked, uh, you know, a program where German, Japanese, British, and French astronauts could participate in our program. The immediate result of that was the Apollo-Soyuz test project, the handshake in space. Forty years ago, next month, uh, European and, and Canadian participation in the space station. Japan was asked to participate and said it wasn't ready yet technically. What NASA thought it wanted to do after Apollo was build a space station with the shuttle as a logistics vehicle. But it couldn't get any White House or congressional or space community support for a space station. 
And so by the middle of 1970, a year after Apollo 11, NASA said, space station we're going to push to the indefinite future. The program for our decade of the 1970s has to be the space shuttle. And after Tom Paine either left or was pushed out of the White House in the summer of uh, 1970, it, the acting administrator became a career NASA person named George Lowe, and he wrote to the uh, Office of Ban Management Budget these words, which I think were the winning argument. You know, with the shuttle, the U.S. can have a continuing program of manned spaceflight without a commitment to a new major goal. And I think that was the logic that led ultimately to the approval of the shuttle. If, you, if the shuttle was designed to serve as a space station, you didn't have a space station. You had to figure out a new reason to build the shuttle. And, and there was a lot of, of, of turmoil in, it, in how to do that. At the start of the post-Apollo review in 69, there were people saying, well, if the shuttle is really reusable and cheap, then it should launch everything, not only NASA payloads, but the Department of Defense. And so the Space Task Group called Na told NASA and the Department of Defense to study whether uh, a single system could meet their requirements. What was being studied during this period was a two-stage reusable uh, shuttle. It's hard in retrospect to imagine what this thing would have been like. This booster stage would have been the size of a 747. And the orbiter stage would have been the size of a 767. Really a 707, but nobody remembers the 707. You all have seen, one way or another, the shaped space shuttle main engine. There are three of them back here. Same engine was here with 13 of them. I mean, this would have been a behemoth kind of development project. You know, why does a shuttle look the way it does? It has a 60-foot payload bay. Why? Because our photo reconnaissance satellites are 60 feet long. Uh, the shuttle was sized to launch our spy satellites. Its capabilities included the ability to go from the west coast, either deploy or capture in one orbit, uh, a national security payload, one of these spy satellites probably, and get back to where it took off in one orbit. In that 90 minutes of the orbit, the Earth would have rotated 1,100 miles, across the range of 1,100 miles, and that hypersonic maneuvering required delta-shaped wings and heavy thermal protection that would not otherwise have been required. So the shape of the shuttle with its stellar wings came out of this requirement. The 15 feet wide payload bay was some national security payloads, but primarily to be able to launch eventually space station modules that was there from the start. And the weight of these various payloads determined the lifting power of the shuttle. So it was national security more than civilian requirements that defined the shuttle, which is kind of ironic because the shuttle never performed these missions. The report itself in June of 69 is still classified, but somehow the executive summary is declassified and has some kind of provocative language. One of the shuttle missions, interception and inspection of objects in space, since the national ability to intercept, inspect, and determine, as well as possibly destroy unknown satellites. Sat the shuttle was an ASAT system. If it could rendezvous with Hubble, it could rendezvous with lots of things. And picture this mission, crisis someplace in the world, launching a shuttle on demand, going one orbit around the world, and landing at Andrews Air Force Base so the information could be rushed to the president. Pretty exotic ideas of what this vehicle should be capable of. Finally, in mid-71, NASA said we can't build this two-stage fully reusable on the budgets we're likely to get, and probably it's too big a technical challenge. But NASA also said we need a decision by the end of this year. So there was a six-month period, very harried in all kinds of ideas, different shuttle designs. There was a new head of NASA, Jim Fletcher. If you look, the uh, moon picture is already gone in April of 71. Uh, Fletcher was the president of the University of Utah before coming to Washington, and his deputy, George Lowe, extremely influential in this whole process. Nixon's budget team, uh, George Schultz, George is still alive, Secretary of State under Reagan, was the head of OMB, 
The deputy head was a Californian named Casper Weinberger, later Secretary of Defense, known as Cat the Knife for his budget cutting tendencies. And a young man named Don Rice was the assistant director in charge of the part of OMB that dealt with the space budget. And it was Rice that became the primary uh, adversary of approved, shovel approval. Uh, science advisor Ed David was very much involved, a young man, uh, an engineer rather than a scientist. That was the opposing force. As this debate took place, neither the staff nor NASA knew that Nixon, in essence, had already said yes to the job. This is a clue of how Nixon made decisions for one thing. People wrote memos. They went through an intricate process to get to the president's briefcase to take home at night. Nixon would sit in Lincoln bedroom, music playing, more than likely a scotch at his side, and write on the memos. So here's a memo from Weinberger, who was the space cadet in this group of people, saying that Apollo is giving the American people a much needed lift in spirit. And the people of the world will look at, uh, need to look at American superiority. If we don't continue human spaceflight in some form, uh, it will show our best years are behind us, and starting to give up our superpower status. And it came back with Nixon's notation, I agree with Cap. This was before the debate actually started. I would say this was the first decision that there would be a shuttle. As the debate went forward, Nixon was going to run for re-election, of course, and his opponent at this time, hard to remember, given that he ultimately beat uh, George and Govern in every state except Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. But his opponent at this time was a senator named Ed Muskie of Maine, and Muskie was running ahead in the polls. Nixon made the calculation that he had to win California, and so political acts to give him support in California were extremely important. That's the context for this conversation. John Rosen was a top advisor to the people in Southern California. And it's a, it's a highly visited kind of thing. If we were an ounce stadium or some kind of drug that was spaced up, that's a that's a big thing. It's not very much out national leadership at its best. <laughs> this is a picture of the meeting in which uh, Schultz and uh, Weinberger from OMB and John Ehrlichman, uh, Nixon's top domestic advisor, met with Nixon. And one of the things that was done was to approve uh, the space shuttle. But what Nixon approved was the recommendation of OMB to do a smaller shuttle. Uh, there were really only two alternatives presented. One was NASA's full-size, full-capability shuttle, 15 by 60 payload bay and, and all the capabilities, or, or a simpler, less advanced, less technologically challenging, uh, kind of X-plane experimental shuttle vehicle, which was OMB's alternative. Nixon said, let's do the smaller one, but work it out with NASA. Of course, NASA protested, and through the rest of the month, NASA protesting, OMB pushing back. Ultimately, the decision was made over the New Year's weekend, 71, 72. Here were the options they presented for decision. Payload bay size, payload weight capability, cost to develop the various systems, the cost per flight. And NASA said, we really would recommend the big shuttle, but uh, given the budget constraints, we'd, we'd be happy with the 14 by 45 foot payload bay, uh, 5 billion to develop, and operating cost of 7.5 million flight. The full capability is what, 7.7, I think. George Schultz said, it seems to me the big shuttle makes the best sense, and he had been informed before this meeting it would also create the more, most jobs uh, in California. OMB and the science advisor said, no, that's really a bad idea. They made their argument, and they lost. Schultz told NASA, you could go ahead and begin to build the big one. 
Now, Nixon wasn't involved in this at all. Nixon, I don't think, had any influence on the final design of the shuttle, which is not too surprising. It's a pretty detailed decision for a non-technical president. The meeting was quickly arranged in California, as Nixon had uh, proposed in November, to let him say he had approved the shuttle uh, in San Clemente. There was a name recommended for the program, to call it Space Clipper. The speech was already written with Space Clipper in it, and Nixon didn't like the name. So he said, now we'll, we'll name it later. And of course, it never was named anything except Space Shuttle. It's going to be Pegasus. Yankee Clipper, there were a whole long list of names that were considered. But there are interesting records of this discussion where Nixon says, make sure you say it's not a toy, especially a $7 billion toy. Saying the shuttle will revolutionize transportation into space by routinizing it. It will take the astronomical cost out of astronautics. This expectation that the shuttle would be routine and inexpensive was there from the start and it's one of the haunting legacies of this decision process. With that decision to go forward with the shuttle, and here are, in my judgment, the three decisions he made in this uh, three-year period. Lowering ambitions in space, treating the space program as just one of the things the government did, and build the program around the vehicle without a clear goal for that vehicle to serve. Nixon did see space as symbolic of American leadership, but he didn't think he had to spend money at the Apollo pace to achieve that level of symbolism. Was it a mistake to downgrade the priority of the program and exploration? Uh, say the space program had to compete and was no longer special. Certainly the space advocacy community has made that argument for the past 40 years, or that the space program should have higher priority. Or was it a reasonable decision in the context of the time, reflecting what public opinion and political uh, support for the program was, that there wasn't any compelling reason to do another Apollo-like program? Did Nixon make the right choices? Then why did he approve the shuttle? One was the symbolism of human spaceflight as an element of US leadership. Second, he was apparently a had the chance to uh, interview John Ehrlichman after he got out of jail after Watergate. And Ehrlichman said that Nixon was intrigued by some of these national security uh, uses of the shuttle. And then the job impact before the 72 election, I think, was the ultimate final reason for going ahead. At the presidential level, I don't think these claims of being routine and inexpensive were very influential, but certainly they persisted through the history of the program. And here's Nixon a couple months after the decision, talking to a delegation from New York saying, let Grumman in Long Island develop the shuttle rather than companies, and at that time it would obviously have been Rockwell in California. After all, since we are going on the space station, on the space shuttle, and I take it the deep for putting the money there on the ghettos and all that sort of thing. But then, my God, we better at least get a little credit for this is jobs. Well, the shuttle certainly met the objective of keeping Americans flying, creating prestige, creating new and unmatched capabilities, and the shuttle was a resounding success. Take a look at, I put together this as its record of accomplishment of all the things the shuttle did. And you can take a quick read. Uh, uh, open up space for access to lots of people all kinds of capabilities. We certainly wouldn't have a space station without the shuttle. We wouldn't have Hubble without the shuttle. So in those terms, uh, I think a resounding success. In terms of its military use, it was kind of imposed on the operating parts of the military and intelligence community, which fought it. But some of its leadership redesigned, particularly some of the intelligence satellites, so they could only be launched on the shuttle keep the shuttle from cancellation. Then, after the Challenger accident, there was a decision not to launch from the West Coast, which was driven mainly by wanting to go into polar orbit. The same satellites were redesigned to be launched on expendable launch vehicles, and new expendable launch vehicles were developed. 
various people I've talked to said that it was 20 to 50 billion dollar cost to the national security space budget. Certainly not a success in those terms. And the widely accepted view of NASA and this program, space program as a jobs program, I think had most of its origin with the Nixon decision to go forward with the big shuttle as a job producing element. And joined at the hip were the shuttle and the space station. Even back in the fall of 71, OMB was saying, as soon as the shuttle's flying, NASA will come back to us and ask for approval of the space station. 